Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the 10th episode and finale of Eddie's podcast. Today we have a really cool guest, the Palm Beach columnist and a new author, Leslie Gray Streeter. Leslie, are you with us today? I am. And Leslie, you dropped quite a bomb on social media this past week. I uh, did. What's the great, beautiful news in your life? I am moving to Baltimore. I am leaving the Palm Beach Post and South Florida. Um, I'm going to be leaving Florida before I leave the Post. I'll be leaving in July, and then I will work remotely. The plan is until the end of August. Um, but yeah, it's it was time. I'm from Baltimore. I have family there. I'm honestly worried about this COVID situation here. It's getting better other places and getting much worse here. And um, I just want my son to be in a place um, that's a little, a lot more diverse. Um, that's a lot more um, people that I grew up with and who knew his dad who can tell him about his dad. I mean, there's so much of that area that is attractive to me. I mean, nothing's perfect, but it's it's pretty attractive to me. And your mom came down here with you, but basically all your, your family is up in Baltimore. Well, well, actually, no, very few people are in Baltimore. Most people are like around, um, around Maryland. My mother and dad grew up closer to DC. So, and if you know that area, you know that that's a, a cultural shift, but, um, they raised us in Baltimore because they went to college there, but I'm moving to Baltimore because that get really great houses for a pretty good price. It's a very diverse city. There's a lot of progressive stuff going on. Um, we'd be in the same neighborhood with uh, my best friend's family and Scott's family is pretty close by and I'll be about 35 minutes from my sister in Annapolis. Well, I know you've been a columnist for the Palm Beach Post since 2002, and I think I speak for all of Palm Beach County that we're going to really miss uh, reading your articles locally. I know you're on to bigger and better things, which we'll talk about in a second, but you have been such a blessing to our county, and thank you for uh, for your your words and thank your, you. you know, it's guidance. It's been wonderful. It's been wonderful. I mean, I never imagined when I moved here at 31 that I was going to be here for 18 years or what, you know, really weird and interesting ups and downs my <laughs> life would take. But I've always felt very supported by the community here. And it's 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 sad to leave, but it's time to leave. Well, um, we we let, wish you luck on your next adventure. And let's talk about the book, Black Widow, A Sad, Funny Journey through grief for people who normally avoid books with words like journey in the title. Yep. Um, it, it was a great book. Uh, both Jackie and I have read it now a couple times. Um, and to be honest with you, I, um, the subject matter deals with, you know, the grief of the loss of your husband. And at times I was uh, reading it and sentences would make me very sad, but at the same time, I would laugh because of the humor that you would inject and, and I would find myself kind of guilty that I was laughing out loud at such a, um, a you know, a grief stricken moment for you. Well, and that was to me really the point of it is that life is fluid and feelings are fluid and there's like a continuum, you know? So I feel like I just wrote the way that it felt to me and I wasn't trying to make it funny. I wasn't like, you know, slipping on a banana peel under the casket or whatever. Um, and it wasn't like, I must have a moment in here that was funny. I just wrote it how it felt. And I think that all of us have moments in sadness where we look back and we go, oh yeah, it was also funny that like, you know, cousin Darlene never liked grandma and she was up there, you know, saying nice things about her at the yes. funeral. Like what? You know, or like stuff like that where you just, I think our brains do that. and I. Th Think that you know the divine does that to break those moments up so don't feel guilty that was it it came out the way it was supposed to i guess i also felt like you have a talent for uh i think you have a bit of a dark sense of humor maybe I do. and you <laughs> and you do have a talent for making the reader for making people see the funny side of things that may or may not be funny and in a very relatable way because at one point in the book you're talking about your mom giving you a little grief or you're thinking your mom might give you a little trouble because you were eating barbecued chips and you were wiping the <laughs> you know the salt and the barbecue <laughs> and at the same time when I was reading the book 
I was eating Cheetos and I was wiping the doodle dust off. So yes. very relatable in the weirdest possible way. By the way, ways. who is that? Who is that? This is Abby. Oh. Abby likes to participate when we do the podcast. Hi, Abby, oh, what a face. Look at that face. Yeah, oh, she's my a goodness. good girl. I love that. She, oh, has a, she has a twin just like you do. Oh. She oh. does. He's around here somewhere, but uh, we don't have that much time, so I won't introduce no, you all the dogs this some time. Some other time I'll have to Zoom you guys. And literally, I mean this. Yeah. I want to see your dogs. Even if not in person, I want you to hold your dogs. But that's another thing. Um, Absolutely. Now, it's so funny about humor, because people, like, they put humor in a box. I truly find things that are funny. There's thing, funny things in kind of everything. Sometimes, like, you'll have a fight. I'm, I don't know about you guys in your relationship, but, like, my husband and I would have, like, stupid fights, and then something dumb that seemed really serious would happen, and we'd start laughing. It's like, okay, that was dumb. This whole thing was dumb. Never mind. Whatever. And I think I, that sort of reads into my humor. What I don't find funny is meanness. I don't like mean humor. I don't yes. like South Park. I don't like Family Guy. I don't like things that are cruel that that say I ha we have to shoot down a target that we've decided is worthy to shoot down because we felt like it. it doesn't even have the jokes are even funny it's just like look we're mean and yes. I, it's not what I like you know so I like goofy things and there is something you know slightly dark about finding anything funny about picking out your husband's uh, grave site but at the same time yeah. that moment was kind of like what do I do? Or just like, there's a part they didn't make it in that they were driving us around to the different parts of the cemetery. And there was like the military part and there was the, the Jewish part. And then there was one, something called baby land. Oh, yeah. and I was, and we looked at each other and I was like, that's super on the nose in a really not cool way. So every once in a while, yeah. the next we go, well, at least you're not going to be buried in baby land. Go, ah! Wow. You know, which is once again, awful. But yeah. why would you call it baby land? It was funny because it was wrong. That's right. And, and you did a terrific job getting across Scott. Oh, thank you. Just you come, I came out of this book um, feeling as though I was friends with both of you, but feeling very much like I had met Scott. Oh, I hope so. That was my, that was my aim with that part of it. And I'd say in the book that a, a friend of Scott's was like, listen, make Scott real. Don't just make him some guy who died and make him a real person. And I tried to do that. And I think that I did a good job mostly because he was so vibrant and people have so many stories on my Facebook page. You guys are both on my Facebook page. I'll ask for Scotty Z stories. I'll go, so just random day on board, tell me a story I don't know. And the opportunity to meet my husband through different people's eyes in ways that I've never seen him because I didn't know him when some of these people knew him or they didn't right. know these particular sides of him has been really wonderful. And so I feel like I'm constantly, five years after his death, I'm constantly learning new things about him or having new stories um, and new associations with things that will now make me laugh. And it's a real blessing. And while it's a, a memorial about this experience, it kind of also memorializes who Scott was. And I, I can see Brooks like picking this up someday and, and really saying, oh, wow, this is, you know, this gives me a lot of information about my dad. I hope so. I hope so. And um, I, I just, I want to, I want to be that for him the most. I want that to be for him. So I, I found the chapters to be really interesting because for the most part, they're uh, named after um, 70s, 80s kind of uh, theme uh, musics, either sitcoms or those yeah. hour, hour long shows that we all Absolutely. love. Um, is that part of the narrative? Well, I just, it's such a big deal. Everything in publishing I hear is, I feel is a big deal. Like the cover and the cover art and the name and the, there have to be, they didn't want it just to be, Chapter one, chapter two, like, you're not going to let you go that easy. You're that kind of writer. It needs to be significant. So I just was like, what, what is a thing that's me? And what is a thing that's fairly established about me, if you know me, and will be established when you read about me? And it's that I'm a pop culture reporter. And that it's that the book itself, the narrative is full of pop culture references and stuff. And I was like, what if I just, I think it came from, one of the chapters to me was very obviously, the last chapter was very obviously should be called, you're gonna make it after all. And I thought, cause Mary Tyler Moore, and I thought, well, 
what else can I do? What else is in there? So when I went to the very first chapter, and it's about the messed up reality, introducing people to myself into my widowhood, and the Fresh Prince thing came up, I was like, all right, this is a game. Now, it didn't work and everything, and some of them I changed, but 70%, I think, of the chapters have that reference, or those references. And I also like the fact that I didn't say, and now here's the part where I make these references, because I think pop culture references are, are, they lose their power if you have to point them out to people, you have to explain them. So I, I did read the Fresh Prince part as though I was singing along. Now, I may have sung along, I'm not gonna lie. That's good, now this is a story all about how my life got flipped and so, exactly. And I know that some people aren't gonna read it. I mean, this, the culture, pop culture stuff, is firmly aimed at people our age, you know, because that's what uh, what I know. And I have some older references and some newer references, but I absolve myself of having to um, be current because that's not my it's not my book. If you wanted to read something like that, you would read the book of a twenty five year old, uh, not mine. So, um, and. I tried to, I took, I took a lot of things out just because I didn't want to make it so that, that it would really hang up people who weren't familiar, but I kept enough of it in there that it was me and that you didn't spend the whole time, like you needed a thesaurus going, who is Ethan Hawke? I don't understand. What, who is Sheila E? What is this? And those references stayed in there, but I took some of them out. I think they were probably, probably lost one Sheila E reference and probably two other Ethan Hawke references, but they stayed. The other ones okay. The, the book kind of uh, starts off in the middle of this, this tragic event. Um, and uh, it, it appears that you're actually writing as these events were happening. Is, is that how this book started? Did you just, were you journaling this or did, did you come back and revisit it? I wrote that probably a month after it happened, maybe. Um, that chapter I started and just wrote. Um, I would take notes. I'm not like a let me buy a journal and faithfully write in my journal person. I'm more of a when it strikes, it strikes. And so there, there were bits of memories on note, the notes mode in my phone or on receipts as I was waiting to talk to someone on the phone about canceling something and explaining to them once again that Scott was no longer here and didn't know the money anymore. Um, you know, that kind of thing. And I would just write stuff down. I would like, something would strike me. And I would go, blah, 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 blah. And I tried, I'm not super organized, but I tried to keep those things together. The notes mode thing was great because I always had my phone. Um, and then the that first chapter, like I said, I just kind of it out. And there were some tweaks on it, but that's basically what happened. And one of my favorite parts without spoiling it, and it's not like a major uh, moment, but it just shows the, the constant funny um, comic parts to this experience where you're um, talking to what you term as the bad cop and he's kind of treating you in an insensitive way and, and you kind of muse, uh, what is this guy in a band that I gave a bad review to? <laughs> But, I know. really did have this moment where I'm like, is he always this way or did I do something to him or there's something about him? But yeah, I had this moment. I was like, I don't understand. And, and not that I am well known outside of Palm Beach County because I'm not. I'm beginning to be, but mostly this is my area. So I will constantly run into people who apparently feel some kind of way about me, good or bad, and I have no idea who they are. I don't remember them. Somebody will say, hey, um, you know, that's blah, blah, blah. And I go, I don't know who that is. But then who I am. So, and I'm sure it's like that with you, Eddie, that you're a public person. So there are a lot more people who know who you are than you remember. Because in the context of a lot of things, you're the person giving information, you know, as an attorney or, you know, on your, you know, on the show or whatever. And there's people who are watching it. So your audience is bigger than you. And it's hard sometimes because I, sometimes I'll see people and I'll think, there's a reason they're not smiling at me and I don't know why. Did they date? And sometimes it's like they dated a friend of mine or, you know, it really was like, I said something about a band that they liked that I didn't like. I mean, it really is weird stuff like that. And you I know. get a lot of, oh, you're Jackie. I've seen you on Facebook. <laughs> yes. Yes. So Leslie, you're an award-winning journalist. You're, mm -hmm. you're leaving um, the post soon. You have a great book here. What, 
do you have another project that you're working on? Can you tell um, us anything? My project is project finding a permanent job is my project. Um, while I am, that's exciting. It's scary. I mean, I, I'm going to be okay for a little bit, but um, I, I got some stuff. I got some stuff's coming in. I got an email yesterday about something that's coming. I'm like, yes, chiching, chick, check, check. But you know, I know a lot of people who kind of let it swing and I cannot quite do that because I have a child and like I have a mortgage at some point or whatever. So I can't super let it go, but I have some writing projects I want to do. I have some things that should be coming up in the future. And there's the opportunity for things to happen with this book in terms of um, we've optioned it for TV and we are waiting to um, we're putting things together and the people who optioned it are putting things together to try to then sell it to a network or a streaming service. So that probably won't happen for a while, but I'm excited for that because that involves um, more money and just another way to tell a story. So. Well, congratulations. That sounds very fun. Um, why don't we talk about what you're good at for a second, uh, pop culture and yes! uh, you know. Uh, so Leslie, we have a lot of time on our hands right now. And we're looking for some TV shows to uh, kind of binge watch. What kind of recommendations do you? And, and I love those things that you can go back. Like I'm, I'm binging the last season and a half. I started with second season watching again of the West Wing and going through, and I've got another um, season and a half left. But Scandal is something I would probably binge again. Um, How to Get Away with Murder. It's something I would probably binge again because it just the ending was perfect. Perfect. Um, I watch a lot of Law and Order reruns. They just sort of show up. Um, there are things right now that friends of mine are binging that are current, um, or at least the seasons just ended. Insecure on HBO is a great show. Um, I, I did Girls once. I would never do that again. Don't. It, it's not. I did it once. It was like I feel like I had to stick through it. Um, Girls was not my thing. I didn't. No. I watched a few episodes and was like, yeah, I, I think I'm old. Yeah, I mean, I was too. And I felt like I, some of it I watched for work and that, cause that's been, I was writing a lot of that stuff. And after a while, I'm like, I would skip like eight episodes, six episodes and go, okay, let me catch up in case something big happens that people are going to be talking about tomorrow. Um, oh, um, The Great on Hulu. Um, it's very, uh, Purposeless, purpose, purposefully, um, historically inaccurate telling of the story of, of Catherine the Great, uh, starring Elle Fanning. It is not for oh. kids. It is. It is very like um, things told out of time. The, the, it's very racially diverse. The cast in a way that Russia was not. Obviously, it's very funny. It's super dirty. It's slightly sexy, and it's the. It's really great. It's really, really great and funny. And at the end, I hope there's a second season. At the end, it's when a coup is about to happen and you go, oh, okay, this is great. But um, that was really great to watch. Um, I did not enjoy um, Hollywood on um, Netflix. That was um, Ryan Murphy's no. sort of yeah. like alternative history of, of Hollywood. I didn't enjoy that. Um, no, I didn't either. I, I tried an episode of that and I didn't like it. Please. I expected to because I, I like a lot of his work. Me too. Nip so Tuck, you know, at least the first few seasons of Nip Tuck was one of my favorite shows ever. I, I Before watched it got weird. Yeah, exactly. I watched the first two seasons until it was clear that they just were going in a debauched way. And I was like, it's not funny For the anymore, shock for, value. For the shock value because the whole point of it was watching these characters trying to hold on to their souls when they decide they didn't have them anymore what was the point there was no point it was like i'm just going to be more degraded it's like so what's the, why i didn't enjoy it after a while but i really enjoyed the beginning i'd forgotten how much i like that show that came on around the time i moved here so i didn't have a lot of friends so i had a lot of time to watch fx so i saw you were up early this morning on twitter goodfellas is a really oh it was the untouchables i was watching um Either or. That's, yeah, you know. The, um, I can't see either one in front of her. No. The Goodfellas is a really wonderful movie, and I'm glad that I saw it, but I never have to watch it again. And that's, that's how my, I felt about it. Yeah, so, like so, Schindler's List, same way. It's like, I don't ever have to do this no more. Beloved, same way. Exactly. Don't ever have to do this no more. I, I live through no. it. I get it. I appreciate it culturally and, you know, for its art. And now I'm like, I'm good. <laughs> Plus, he made Ray Fiennes, who at the time was 
gorgeous look like, you know, a big fat bad guy. And at the time he was beautiful. Oh, Um, oh, so just, yeah. And, and, but I thought what I loved about what I like about Ray Fiennes as an actor is that just like Jude Law, that they were these beautiful men who were confident enough in their looks that they're willing to play horrible people. And also because their beauty becomes a factor in their villainy. Their beauty becomes a yes. factor. Ray finds beauty. Just, he was just a straight up beautiful man. And that the English fresh- patient. Oh my God. Ugh. Ugh. Sorry, that Eddie. Was, I love you. <laughs> I, I, I would say very quickly, it was one of those movies that I, I Thought I liked it the first time and I watched it again and realized, no, I was caught up in the pageantry, but I hated all of these people. Um, it was beautiful. <laughs> I had just read the book and the oh, book, wow. if you've read it, is really, it, it's different. I mean, it's the same, but it's so different from the movie that I was just really like, oh, wow. How did they take, you know, this, the English patient book and turn it into this movie? I am not that talented. So that was really exciting to me. That's really cool. I love that. This is this is a flashback. Ask a local from our Ask a local. Oh campaign. my gosh! All the things. Yeah, I know you're a big fan of Scandal. I love. Scandal. She asked about Scandal and okay. Scandal. Trashy. It's so funny because the first season was they tried to do it like a procedural, like you know, here's this fixer in DC, and every week there's some. And then they decided, you know, we're just going to make it this trashy. You know, it's sex and affairs and murder and rigged elections and it just goes nuts and it's really fun honestly um there's a couple seasons where you're like i hate all of these people so i have to make a decision <laughs> we're gonna keep following this literally but i really liked it um i had a discussion with a friend of mine um about the olivia pope character and she does all these dumb things and it, i'm not the first person to say, person to say this because it, it was a very um diversely um cast show but the character has like three friends and none of them are black women and i was like if she had black girlfriends i'd be like girl do not do that that is bad for you and then what then the show would have been over <laughs> pulling you out and scott foley is on scandal too oh my gosh he's a psychopath scott foley on scandal too? yeah he's like a hot psychopath oh wow yeah no he's okay that's fine oh you'll and he wears a uniform a lot so oh my. he's Oh yeah, it's he was my favorite part of that show, um, and the writing was really great. And there's a character. It's so funny how character development happens. I won't give it away, but there's a character that I wanted re- first really disliked, and she became one of my favorite characters because they let her go. They were like, you know what? Everything that happened in your life that would happen to you, you probably be crazy. So go for it. <laughs> yeah, it's super fun. Yeah, it's fun. I just finished um, how to get away with murder. With murder. Um, that which, is that one also good. Um, I don't know if it's good. It is very engrossing. I think good, when you say good, like, is it like, um, artistically redeeming? Probably not. There are some very important points, parts of it, like about, you know, different kinds of relationships and about, um, the struggles of being a professional black woman. But there's also lots of murder and stuff that's not realistic. And it's, you keep going, why why do these people still have jobs? Who would still talk to them? I don't understand why why this is a thing. But that's, <laughs> yeah. I might start. I just finished it. I might watch that all over again. I'm watching the last two days. I've been um, binging the the West Wing again. Jackie's been watching this yeah, program. I, I'm not familiar with called Scrubs. Yes. How do you not know Scrubs? <laughs> dude? I don't watch nearly as much TV as the two of you do. I'm. I'm uh Jackie is so much more immersed in pop culture and smarter than me. Uh, Scrubs was great man. Scrubs was about it was a funny show that could then, like my book, be very serious in some ways about young doctors. Yeah. And um and it had just like great stuff like once again, it was a very a, a diverse cast. Um, it was like, it, they would break in a song for no reason. Um, the two leads, um, are best friends who were probably a little too close, um, and are nuts. Um, it's just really fun. It's a really fun show. Like I said, there were some very sad, serious parts. Scott Foley was on that too. Um, yes, he was. And I just listened to the podcast 
podcast with Scott Foley on it yesterday when I was driving around. I haven't heard it yet. I'll have to. Which was also a lot of fun. And you can tell that those people really like one another. I think that's probably the most important thing. Um, They had Neil Flynn on too, the janitor. And you can just tell that these people, every every person they've had on, you can just tell they all love each other so much. The, the, um, there's a, I haven't listened to it in a while. I tried to listen to it this morning and I couldn't get it to work on Spotify. Uh, West Wing Weekly, um, the uh, podcast oh. is really great. Um, and everyone that they have on there, um, I'm forgetting his name, the actor that played Will Bailey um, in the later seasons, uh, Joshua Molina, Molina, and another guy. And it's really great. And yeah. they've had, Billy Hill and you know different people on the show and it is it's and once again I'm so obsessed with that show it's always great to try to um go back and watch those episodes and get like the deep dive into it it's great yes these podcasts are kind of bringing back things for us absolutely what other shows Leslie would you recommend uh if you have some time you know, oh what, wow what is Leslie um, watching I, I just finished watching this incredibly beautiful and trashy, trashy neo Dallas kind of thing with Kevin Costner called Yellowstone. That's on Paramount, the Paramount channel um, that starts again. The third season starts again, starts tomorrow. And it is just, it is dynasty, but trashier and drunker, but with beauty. And it's, but it's, it's also like, um, he's a guy who owns a cattle ranch in montana and his children are all messed up. one of his sons married a native woman and for the for when you first meet him has left the family lives on the reservation with his wife and child and you know because it's a show it's not that's not gonna last and there's one son who i think is like a ranger and there's one son who's like a lawyer who's a jerk and the daughter is like the daughter is like this if she were the were a son would have been the son that took over everything she's like jr but a woman she like right. and she's in love with like the guy that is there um she's been having a, like a relationship that was never quite a relationship for years with um the guy who's her foreman who's been with them since he was young and she drinks too much and you'll for some reason both she and the dad honestly kind of hate one of the son, the other sons and you don't know why but i think you'll find that this it's like there's like everybody's murdered somebody <laughs> again like how they go with murder or scandal everybody's murdered somebody it's the it's gorgeous. There's like nuts, nutty. There's kidnappings and Kevin Costner is just a really great presence and he's really good. I didn't know how he would be on a television show, but like it's, it's, it's a television show that's shot like a movie every week. Yeah. Great expanses. It's if it, that's really fun. Um, I'm about to start watch Greenleaf, which is on the own channel, which is about a uh, family um, that runs a, a mega church in Memphis. Um, that's really like once again that it's all everything i watch is like soap opera on let's be honest everything i've named is like a soap opera but with you yeah know, it's very good i mean what? i grew up on dallas and dynasty so yeah i remember general hospital and they made the weather machine so they yes they could, they could the, manipulate the weather <laughs> the cassidy i can't what? believe i yeah. knew that you can, Laura. Well, like, I think that a lot of that honestly it's ex- okay the things that I like, I think explain a lot about me and how I write and who I am because I grew up in the seventies and eighties. I like big stuff. I like, um, you know, very melodramatic, like, you know, um, Joan Collins and her earrings, like take your earring off melodramatically and talking on the phone and Diane Carroll slapping people and throwing, throwing down furs and that. So I've always responded to, to that because it's fun. And I just, it was funny because in the nineties, everything was supposed to be so like reserved and ironic and whatever. I'm like, no, slap more people. That's <laughs> fun. Throw stuff. It's like all this like, <laughs> I had a fool to admit that I really like something and I'm going, woohoo, you know, so that's, I think that's what set me apart because everyone else was trying to be cool. And I and my, my <laughs> friends and their pictures are always wearing black. And I'm wearing like a pair of overalls with a pink t-shirt and dumb earrings. So I'm like, Yeah. So. <laughs> There's one thing that might go along with that. So jaunty hats, Leslie. 
I yeah. put on my jaunty hat for you. I love it. The jaunty hat you mentioned in the book a couple of times. Yeah. Is that actually a Leslie thing? Do you enjoy your big dynasty style hat? I have because there is that hat. stereotype of, you know, black women going to church and their big I, landscape hats. I was in the, there some people at the churches I grew up in had big hats. It wasn't as, it was the older ladies wore the big hats. My mother was not a hat person. I like hats because they're fun. I don't wear them a lot, but I do. I'm looking around my room and there's a bunch of hats in my room for my Molly Ringwall costume that I wore recently. Um, I had a hat because you got to have a hat and a red wig. Um, yeah. But yeah, I just mm -hmm. also, I just love the word. And I just, I love accessories. Like I said, I don't, my ears aren't pierced. So I, I wear clips so I can wear like big goofy ones like this. Um, I love, I love jewelry. Mm -hmm. You know, I got to go and I had dinner on a friend's porch six feet away yesterday. And I actually dressed like a fun t-shirt and leggings yes. and boots and earrings and like a necklace. I was like, I feel like me, I'm overdressed. Yes. I get so dressed up to go to pet supermarket now. <laughs> my, my gas bill is so low. That's kind of crazy. Have you ever seen the musical Hamilton or, or heard it? I just saw it um, at the Kravis earlier this year. Um, and it was, it's one of those things where you, you hear a hype and go, well, this can't possibly be this good. And it really was. It really was just, and now, I mean, I think everyone should watch it now because it had so much to say about what our country really is and what it was based on. And when you see people of color playing slave owners, you know, and you see them who were talking about freedom. And when you see this casting of people expressing these timeless, um, timeless thoughts and, and processes, but in a way, um, so wonderful. It's not. It's so funny because people I, uh, for a million years will now try to get it wrong because it wasn't successful because it was rap. It wasn't successful just because it was multicultural. It was successful because Lin Manuel Miranda understood why those things were important to the story, and they became integral to the story. And he told it in a way that other people couldn't have. And it's it's brilliant. My sister's name is Lynn, so I feel like <laughs> it's, it's close. There's that connection. Close enough. Yeah. There you go. So in this pandemic, there's also this incredible movement happening right now where we're taking race and systematic racism in a much different uh, note. And it seems like um, events keep happening to shine lights on why this needs to have a light on it. And as a society now, we're struggling to, to deal with that. And... Um, I don't know. Um, I, I'm a, I admit I'm a white privileged dude and uh, I can never understand what it would be like to, to, you know, I'm a divorce attorney and, and people hate divorce attorneys, but I can't ever imagine <laughs> going through your life um, like that. Uh, well, here's the thing. I, I let me say being black is awesome. It's people's reaction to my being black is a problem. It's not my problem. It's other people's problem. Being black is amazing. I'm descended from really strong people who did some really great stuff. I have really fun hair. I like my skin color. I don't look my age. They say black don't crack. All that is great. Um, I have really good mm -hmm. skin. However, it's the reaction of two people of people to me and people who are like me based on years and years and ages of anti-black racism, which is worldwide, um, because you look around the world and everyone's selling lightning creams and stuff. Nobody wanna be, as uh, Paul Mooney said, everyone wanna be black, but nobody wants to be black. Everybody wants to like listen to jazz and listen to rap, wear the earrings and stuff, but nobody wants to actually go through the experience of what that means. And I, I mean, I, you know, I, I wouldn't choose, I wouldn't choose to be anyone else. I wouldn't choose to be anything else. I'm very proud of who I am. Um, not in spite of, but because of those things. Um, having said that, the reason that we're in, we're, we're all, we are where we are because everyone wanted to ignore it for so long. 
And someone asked me yesterday why they thought it was coming up now. And I think it's because, I mean, it's not like we didn't see Rodney King. It's not like we didn't see Philando Castile. But for some reason, the George, the right. George thing, watching, because it, it happened with everything else, you could go, oh, well, they startled them. So we had to shoot them. Or he, they thought he had a gun. This man was clearly for nine, almost nine minutes, handcuffed on the ground, incapacitated under someone's knee. And you can try to explain away by his criminal um, background, which was significant, but had nothing to do with why he was arrested and in custody that day. You can try to say everything about, oh, they were in fear. What were they in fear? There were four of them and one of him. Um, you can try to say so many things. And there was, I think that people are uncomfortable with admitting because of privilege. People are uncomfortable admitting because then you have to think about what maybe you've done or maybe attitudes you had, or why it's easier to fight with black people about race Or haven't it, done. Or haven't done, exactly. Well, it's easier to fight with me on Twitter about why I'm wrong than it is to fight with your uncle when he says the N-word at Thanksgiving. And why is that? Why do you right. feel more comfortable dismissing my experience and the experience of millions of other people when you can't express, you can't address it at your house? You know what happens because you hear the jokes. You're in these places. You hear the comments. And you, oh, he's old. Oh, he's crazy. Yeah, he's old and crazy, and there's millions of others like him. And they're making the laws, and they're making the rules, and they're shooting people. They're in Wellington telling 15-year-old girls they don't belong in the um, gated communities where they live, you know. So right. that's, but that's what I think about that. I feel like I can go back. I can go back, you know, 30, 40 years and think, you know, nothing has changed. This is all very much the same. Going back to Rodney King and things that happened before that, you know, nothing has changed. It feels very similar to me and what happened to the perceived progress that we thought we had made. But for you, the police violence actually goes back generations. This yeah, is too. something that's actually fairly personal to your family. Yeah. It is. Um, and Eddie, I don't know if you know the story, but yeah, that my great grandfather was murdered by a white policeman in yeah, Seneca, South Carolina. It's in the book. It changed it all. It altered my family, not only that took that person out of our family, but my family had to leave South Carolina and come back to Maryland. My family thought that, my mother's family thought they were in South Carolina, you know, and my parents met because they were back in Maryland in high school and, and in college, you know. So, that act of violence also it set up years of trauma with my granddad he didn't talk about it a lot but i knew about it and i knew that it was a lot of behind a lot of the attitudes and things that he felt i mean how could it not um and i think it it instituted a, a sense of justice um and expecting that justice always was going to come i was shocked when we did um, Ancestry.com and we got, you know, we, you look at things and they say, hey, here's some new um, information. And we got a document was my great grandfather's, uh, his name was J.C. James, didn't stand for anything. Just the, um, his death certificate, it actually mentioned his cause of death as homicide. And we were shocked because it see, they don't do that now. They won't list people that are killed by police officers. Now they won't say that they're murdered till That's it right. hits the airwaves and people get mad. Um, yeah. And the fact that in 19, the 1950s, they were able to admit that he was murdered by this police officer was stunning to me. Um, yeah. Of course, nothing came of it. They admit that he no. was murdered, but nothing came of no. it. No. Years later, that man, I understand, killed himself. And I don't know why, but maybe he was guilty and maybe he saw my great grandfather's yeah. family. And I wouldn't be sorry about that. I'm so, I don't want anybody to die. But if you die and, you know, you have things that you've done in your life that were then, I don't know if he ever killed anyone else. I don't know what his rest of his background was. I don't know if he went home and repented and gave his life to Jesus. I don't believe that that's what happened, but <laughs> you never know. Um, I will say, when you say that nothing's changed, the things that have changed is that even though some people would rather us go back to when we can legally do things, they get so mad because they don't know how to take people like myself or like um, the Obamas or Beyonce or Viola Davis or people who are, do now have a position where they have a platform. That's why they get so mad at Leonard Pitts. That's why they get so mad at, um, you know, uh, Yamiche um, on PBS or people who are able to speak truth to power with this 
with the skin, with this face, because they don't want to talk about it. And it's insulting to some people. I'm not saying everyone, I'm just saying people who are racist are threatened by it. I'm not saying all people. I'm just saying if it bothers you because they're black, it's because you have some racism issues. <laughs> I didn't make that up. So um, there you go. And you have to figure <laughs> out why. You have to figure out what it is about. Seriously, what it is about you that annoys me. I know that there were times where like, when Gossip Girl first came out, I was annoyed by it. It's like, oh, because they're young and skinny and, and I hate them. That's why. Because they can't afford things that I can't afford and it's ridiculous. And then now I just realized it's ridiculous. There's nothing, and it's fiction. It has nothing to do with my life. But I remember like, why do I hate this so much? It's like, oh, that's why I hate it. Because there's a reaction to something that's really about me. Um, it's really about me, my reaction to it. So that's, you have to figure that out. And I, and I, like, I, I wound up liking Gossip Girl after that. So. A lot of self-reflection. Yes. Very and I good. think it's a lot a, of self-reflection and people just are not into it. There's a thing that says um, when you're used to privilege, um, any focus on someone else feels like um, feels like oppression. Because when you're the focus of something all the time and then it's shown at someone else, you're like, no, no, you're, what about me? What about me? It's like everything is about you everything's about you and right. just because someone else gets a chance it's like whenever people go why is there black history month when's white history month i'm like every other month <laughs> the world has gotten so divisive jackie has actually left facebook uh because it's such a hostile environment right now yeah i just wasn't comfortable on, i'm more comfortable on twitter than i was on I facebook think, twitter can be accessible too. i think twitter can be Twitter's more the people that attack you are people that you don't know and you can just delete them. On Facebook, it's like you find out that it's your college roommate. Right. Or my college roommates are amazing. Not them. But like, right. you know, there's, there's people I went to high school with or people that I would meet at a party and go, oh, you're an idiot. And it's just like, delete. But it's right. harder because you have, there's a, a guy that I used to know that a friend of mine and I collectively um, deleted him on Facebook because we were like, Sometimes he's nice, sometimes he's awful. And the times that he's awful, he was really awful. So she said, I think we should do this together. I said, I think we should. So if they, if anyone said, why did you get rid of this person? We could say, well, she did it too. It's because collectively, it wasn't just personal, it was collectively we had an issue. <laughs> I realize that we have a whole lot more uh, work to do. Yes, absolutely. absolutely. So, you know, I... I've been having a lot of hard conversations with people and I, I think that's a necessary thing and, and that's how we're going to achieve this growth. Uh, Leslie, before you, we let you go, are there plans for a second book? Yes, actually. And it's so funny. I started, I was all into it. I wrote like five pages and then everything else in my life, like the world went on pause and then simultaneously blew up because even though I didn't have my physical tour. I have been busier promotionally because you do, I'm doing this, I'm doing podcasts, I'm doing Facebook lives and Zooms and all these things. And so I've got like, besides my full-time job, this is the promotion of this book has become a full-time where I've got like four or five events, sometimes a week. I'm sitting right in my house and yeah. I'm writing and I've got like five stories on a post this week. I think between two, two this morning on the front page and one big one tomorrow. So I've been like super busy and there's just a lot going on in my life and keeping a child alive. So um, it's with all that, I have not had time to do a lot more, but I actually wrote on my calendar. I must write, I must finish the first chapter this weekend. So I find if I write things down, I will probably do them. Probably. Can you, get, can you give us a hint? Fiction or nonfiction? It's fiction. It's, it's a rom-com. Well, the book is called Black Widow, A Sad, Funny Journey Through Grief for People Who Normally Avoid Books with Words Like Journey in the Title. Uh, <laughs> Leslie, thank you so much for joining us today. And um, thank you for being a beacon and not only sharing your story with us, but with the world. And I do believe um, that helps uh, um, sharing uh, these wounds help us all heal. So thank you for everything that you do. Thank you. Hi, I'm Lester Grace Streeter of the Palm Beach Post and of author of the book Black Widow here on Eddie's podcast. You should hear it. It's really cool.